Hi, this is Maria from Four Season Foraging here to talk to you today about daylilies. Before I get into that, just want to say thanks for watching the video. Uh, if you got a minute, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. So daylily, you might be familiar with it. It's a very common plant and cultivated flower that grows in a lot of yards and landscapes. And since this channel is about foraging, um, it might be a bit of a cheat to talk about a cultivated plant, but this plant does actually grow in the wild in a lot of places. It escapes into the wild and in the state of Minnesota it's actually considered invasive because of how readily it escapes. So in most of the United States and in the eastern part of Canada you can actually find this growing in the wild. So I consider it a wild edible, so I'm going to talk about it here today. So daylilies are pretty easy to identify. There are a few lookalikes that you need to know about, but I'll go over that. For common daylily, the Latin name is Humerocallis fulva. So it's not actually a true lily. True lilies are in the genus Lilium. And you can tell the difference between daylilies and true lilies a few different ways. So first of all, daylilies grow from a mass of tuberous roots. So they have all these little potato-like knobs on them. Maybe knobs isn't the right word, but it'll be this like long string with all these little potato-like growths along it. And I will show you a picture of those roots later. Whereas lilies grow from a bulb. And then second of all, when this sends out a flower stalk, the flower stalk will have no leaves on it or it'll just be like a few tiny little scale-like leaves. Whereas the stalks of true lilies have leaves on them and they're like real full-blown leaves. You'll be able to tell they're not just like little nubs on there. So the leaves of daylily are all basal leaves, which means they're the leaves that are close to the ground. So they're coming straight out of the ground. These here, all these are basal leaves. So that's how you tell apart true lilies from daylilies. So true lilies, in case you haven't picked up on that, you don't want to eat those just because it has lily in the name. Don't assume that it's edible because it's not. The daylilies are edible, but as I said, they're not true lilies. So just keep that in mind when you're out foraging for daylilies. And then I also want to talk about the flower of daylily. So the flower has six petals. Um, it's technically three sepals and three petals, but it looks like six petals. And the flower is facing upward. So you have the stalk and the flower comes off like that. And the petals have a slight recurve, but they're mostly flat. And this will help you differentiate it from, for example, tiger lily, which also has an orange flower and looks a little similar. Tiger lily has a flower head that droops over. So it'll be like the flower will be facing down and the petals are totally recurved. So the petals of tiger lily almost touch the flower stem. And of course, tiger lily being a true lily has leaves on the flower stalk, whereas daylily does not. So just to recap, daylily, good to eat. True lilies, do not eat those. So daylily, if you've never eaten it before, it has many tasty edible parts. Right now, probably the most tasty and significant part to eat right now is the shoots. So the shoots is just the green growth when it first starts coming up. And you can see these are all daylily shoots here. And you wanna get them at about this size. Some of these are pretty small. You could definitely go a little taller, like maybe eight to 10 inches. You don't want to get them when they're fully grown or when they're too tall, but at around this size, they're good. And basically all you do is you cut the daylily off at the base and you peel off a few of the outer leaves and then you cut off the tip. So where it starts spreading off at the top, you don't want to eat that, but there'll be like a short segment in there, just a like rectangular kind of part and it'll be light green or maybe 
a little yellowish or whitish and it's crisp and tender and juicy. If you've had cattail shoots before, it's kind of similar to that. And that part you can just eat raw or you can cook it, like try lightly sauteing it in olive oil to toss some salt and maybe a few seasonings on there and it's super tasty. I just wanted to show you a quick close up of the daylily shoot because when the flowers of daylily come up, they're pretty easy to identify, but without the flowers, it takes a little practice. So first of all, I just want to say that the best way to learn the shoot is to identify the plant when it's flowering and then observe it throughout the year and come back next year and look at it. But if you take a look at the shoot here, you can see, again, these are all basil leaves. They're all coming out from the ground and they are curving and these are pretty small still, but as they get older, the leaves will get more floppy and curve over at the top even more. But you can see that they curve out and they have these parallel veins on them. And they're pretty thin, so they bend easily. Like I said, they're pretty floppy. And then if you observe the color, you can see it's green, but has some whitish and light blue tinges as well. Here's some little tiny daylily shoots. These are just like maybe three or four inches tall. Just want to show you what those look like. So here are more daylily shoots. And these are a little taller than the other ones I showed you. These are maybe around 10 to 12 inches, but you can still eat these, cut it off here, and it's probably about this portion there that's edible. But again, you can see how floppy these leaves get as they get older. Like they'll get to the point where they're almost touching the ground again. So these here, are not daylily shoots. These belong to Iris. And I wanted to show you these because they are a look-alike and they should not be eaten because they're potentially poisonous. But you can see the similarity. It has these sword-like basil leaves, but unlike those of daylily, they don't flop over. They're erect growing straight tall. And they're also a lot thicker than those of daily. So that's why they don't flop over as easily is because they're thick. And if you were to dig here, I mean, you can actually see the roots here and you can see how these are different from the tubers that are formed on daily. These are just lateral roots that grow. So be sure to avoid these. So the other edible part of daily that you can harvest right now is the roots. So daylilies grow from this tuberous mass. If I were to dig into the ground here and pull out the root system, it would just look like a bunch of little potatoes all strung together. Um, so when I say potatoes, I mean that really loosely. Like they're very small, usually around one inch, maybe even less than that. But they're just, you know, brown and dirty and kind of potato-like, like a miniature potato, right? And like I said, they're all strung together along the root. So you'll find these tubers and often it'll be really prolific, just like this mass of tubers if you get it at the right time of year and if it's a healthy plant. Sometimes it'll be a little more strung out, but they're there, right? They're under the soil. And I will actually show you some later, but just know that you can eat them raw or cooked. Of course, you want to wash the dirt off first, but raw, they're a bit like jicama. If you've had that before, it's got that like kind of crunchy, again, like a crunchy, juicy kind of quality and cooked again, like a cooked version of jicama. So not super potato-like in texture, but close enough that it's like pleasant for most people and something a lot of folks enjoy. So the time of year you want to harvest it is 
like now ish at least for where i live in minnesota you want to get it in early spring or in late fall when the plant starts getting like full grown in size or near to full grown it's probably too late the roots will be using the starch to put the energy into growing and making a flower and reproducing so the size of the tubers will get smaller they'll get more tough and it just won't be as pleasant because that starch won't be in there so definitely recommend getting it again around this height uh, maybe six to ten inches on the plants and when they're full grown it depends again on where it's growing but usually they'll be around two feet tall when they're fully grown so we have some daylilies growing here you can see the shoots which i just described with the floppy leaves and the basil leaves coming out straight from the ground and you can also for some reason see the tubers on these so i'm guessing the soil just eroded away leaving all these tubers exposed but you can see how like this clump here has all these tubers coming off of it and like this plant here has all these tubers so that gives you an idea you can see you know they're fairly small like i said only about an inch long and sometimes you'll find them bigger but this is pretty typical of the size and you can kind of see what I mean by potato, like just being brown in color. You can also see what I mean where they grow along this long root here. So there's a tuber at the end of each of these long roots. So probably the most famous edible part of the daylily is the flower, which around here in Minnesota anyway, it won't be out for several weeks. It's like a midsummer kind of thing but it's still good to know about because they are very tasty the flowers and the flower buds are both edible and again they can be eaten raw or cooked the flower buds are excellent pickled the flowers you can stuff them think like squash flowers or you can make a fritter out of them again like squash flowers and super tasty that way they have a bit of a almost like a spicy taste like almost like a spicy tomato or something. I'm bad at describing taste, so sorry if that makes no sense. But they're like definitely pretty savory and delicious. And the, so the flower starts out, you know, as a bud that's like long and narrow. And then it opens up into a six petal orange flower. It's technically three petals and three sepals, but it looks like six petals. So that's just what I'm gonna say. And then the flower actually dries directly on the stalk and you can pick the dried flowers and use them in soups. There's actually a famous Chinese soup called golden needle soup that uses the dried flowers of the daylily. So those are all great options and definitely tasty. So keep an eye out later in the summer or if you live further south, they might even be out already in your area. Okay, so here I am coming to you from my porch because it is now raining outside, but I just had a few more final words to say about daily. So first thing is that some people do experience allergies when eating daily, especially when eating it raw. So be aware of that um, when you're eating it for the first time, just try a little bit, wait 24 hours and see if you develop any allergic reactions. And if not, then you'll know it's safe for you to eat. The second thing I wanted to talk about was that there are many different cultivars of daylily. The species I'm talking about today is common daylily or Humerocallus fulva. But as you've seen probably out in the world, there are many other kinds. There's like purple daylilies and yellow daylilies and all the information today applies only to the orange daylily or the common daylily. So 
there's some controversy about whether all the cultivars are edible, whether they all have the same properties or not. So just be aware of that if you are interested in trying like, you know, a purple daylily or a red one or a yellow one that there might be some different chemical constituents or something in there. And it's just not entirely 100% sure whether they have the same edible qualities as the common daylily. So just wanted to make sure that you know that before you go out and try something that could potentially not be so good for you. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. I also have a Patreon page where you can make a monthly pledge to help me keep producing this informative content that you enjoy. So that definitely helps me out a lot too. It starts at just a dollar a month and there's cool benefits with that as well. So if you're able, please join me on there. Regardless, thanks for joining me and I hope you learned a few things and happy foraging.